It's titled 2004, and his Journal of Economics perspective paper points out some of the benefits and some of the risks associated with derivatives. Um, some element of the, the paper is devoted towards uh, looking at swaps, and I thought that probably might help a bit just to see some of the um, key references, and uh, in particular he focuses on the size of the market. He says the market is quite big. And the market, of course, the swaps market is related to other fixed income markets because the swaps essentially involves the trading of interest rates uh, fixed for floating. And that's quite a, a natural type of phenomenon to occur in fixed income, mar income markets because uh, uh, interest rates can be fixed and can be variable or floating. Um, in 1972, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange traded future contracts and currencies. Uh, subsequently, the Chicago Board Options Exchange was set up in 1973. In the late 1970s and 1980s, the swaps market took off, and it took off largely in the back of interest rate fluctuations. One way to observe this directly would be to look at the behaviour of interest rates. One rate in particular um, would be the Fed funds rate. It's a, a key interest rate in the US uh, banking system. It's a rate that at different periods the Federal Reserve uh, targeted and it's currently um, the policy rate um, that um, FOMC use in order to implement uh, either accommodative monetary policy or restrictive monetary policy. But it's fairly clear during this period leading up to the 1980s, in fact, around around the period coinciding with the arrival of Paul Volcker at the Federal Reserve, interest rates behaviour changed. In part, this could be put down to targeting of money supply, which was the new um, policy uh, framework um, that the Volcker incumbency engendered. And there was a change in track at the Federal Reserve. But it's fairly clear, regardless of how that came about, whether it's through monetary targeting or hawkish anti-inflationary type policy stance taken by um, policymakers at the FOMC, the interest rates here peaked and peaked very dramatically. Uh, I would imagine most Treasury departments and big large companies uh, pricked their ears up a little bit and noticed what was going on and interest rate risk management became more centre stage in terms of the governance and in terms of the running of businesses. So this, this peak here uh, was the catalyst to drive the development of, or was one of the drivers of the development of the swaps market. Another big driver of course was the arrival of the ISDA, International Swaps and Derivatives Association, and they became very significantly um, embedded in the market infrastructure. So overall the swaps market, uh, the, the derivatives market grew dramatically during this period, but in particular the swaps market during the, from the 1980s to 2000s and on to the financial crisis. So 2004 paper this preceded the financial crisis, but at that stage, the International Swaps Derivatives Association, a trade association, provides a longer time series of notional amounts of currency, interest rate swaps, and interest rate options. In 1987, the notional amount outstanding of these instruments was 865 billion. In 2003, it was 124. Um, so this market, by this measure, this market grew at the rate of 36% per year over the 16 years. So this is a, a, some indication the degree to which this market has bedded down and become significant in the overall market infrastructure. Also, um, Stultz points out one of the benefits of this uh, market has been a second important benefit from the derivatives uh, market is that they can make underlying markets more efficient for example, derivatives markets produce information in this. In a number of countries, the only reliable information about long-term interest rates is obtained from the swaps. Because the swaps market is more liquid and more active than the bond market, in addition, derivatives enable investors to trade on information 
that otherwise might be prohibitively expensive to trade on, for instance, short sales of stocks are more difficult to implement. Um, so one example might be here to note that the LIBOR market, which is a very important uh, interest rate market, we might have a look at that as well. So if we go back to the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, um, we have 12-month uh, LIBOR, London Interbank Offer Rate, and this this rate is relative, it tracks uh, the Fed funds rate uh, also. It broke down a little bit during the 19, during the 2007 period, in part because of uh, layman's, and in part because the LIBOR rate, actually the rate uh, that is negotiated between uh, blue chip banks uh, based in the UK, but the LIBOR rate is a dollar denominated rate. Um, so in this period here, there was a significant decoupling of Fed funds from LIBOR or decoupling of Fed fun funds from the Treasury rate, the Treasury bill rate, and in part that reflected the credit risk associated with commercial banks. But the LIBOR rate represents uh, a survey of rates uh, for blue chip banks. It's it's the cost, the average cost of bar borrowing at double A uh, blue chip commercial banks um, and the Reuter Thompson surveys these banks daily. Um, now, interestingly, even though this rate is pivotal in the system, some on its own it's hard to read the 10 year or the 5 year or the 15 or 20 year. But because there's a swaps market that negotiates long term swaps, swaps contracts can go up to 30 years. That has enabled um, market participants to infer what the uh, LIBOR rate, because if the fixed for floating is swapping a fixed wing or a fixed rate for a variable rate, where the var variable rate 90% of the time is LIBOR, then these swaps markets provide a lot of information. And so, in a sense, we get the uh, the, the logic here of what Stoltz is saying uh, is does reflect some to to a large degree um, what's might be considered market reality that the swaps market actually reveals the long term LIBOR rate. Now to get a sense of how that might work, I use this um, question and to explain to students how long term LIBOR rates actually can be deduced from the swaps market. I take this example from John C. Hull uh, from his book, Option Futures and Other Derivatives. So let's just take a look at the question and then see, examine a little bit the answer, but also the methodology. The, the one-year LIBOR rate is 10%. Bank trade swaps where a fixed rate of interest is exchanged for 12-month LIBOR with payments being exchanged annually. Two and three-year swap rates expressed with annual compounding are 11% and 12% per annum estimate the two and three year LIBOR rates. So basically we're looking at the rates and in a sense we are going to bootstrap the LIBOR zero curve. The LIBOR zero rate is a, analogous to the zero coupon rates uh, we looked at when we were trying to derive the term structure of a treasury uh, bonds, um, which is a feature of uh, yield curve construction. Most we bootstrap generally the um, interest rates to form the term structure. Um, so basically, we have this LIBOR rate, it's 10%, and that's the LIBOR rate that is currently in vogue. And a bank has uh, set up a fixed rate of interest which is going to be exchanged for a 12 month LIBOR with payments being exchanged annually. So that there is a two year, there's a two year swap where 11% is going to be swapped back for LIBOR. And the, 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 the swap can be divided into two components. There's a fixed side and a floating side. The floating side of the swap always trades at par because the floating side of the swap applies an interest rate and discounts at an interest rate that are equivalent. So the, the LIBOR rate is what's used to derive the payment on the floating side, but it's also being used for discounting. Then the value of this floating side is equivalent to par. So ex ante, looking ahead, the floating side 
of the swap is equal to its notional principle. Um, the fixed side of the swap then has already been predetermined and there's some life left in this swap. And we know that here that for one years and for two years, 11% is going to be exchanged for the floating. And the fixed side of the swap could be seen as a fixed income instrument or a fixed bond instrument. And we know the discount rate in the first period is 10% because we're told that the one-year LIBOR rate, and again we're assuming that this is continuous, and this is what's currently in vogue, that's currently 10%. And the swap may have been negotiated at a previous period and there's two years remaining in the swap. So on the fixed side, there's still 11 to come in year one, at the end of year one, 11, 11 dollars to come at the end of year one, 11 dollars to come at the end of year two, plus the notional principle if we assume it's 100. And we know the discount rate for one year, continuously compounded, using the LIBOR rate that's currently in vogue, is 10%. We don't know the two-year rate, so it's unknown, but we know that the fixed side of the swap must be equal to the floating side of the swap. And so that would imply from this equality that there's only one unknown. And because there's only one unknown, we can then isolate this R2 and solve. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that, again, this equality here, we can present here. And our job is really just to figure out what R2 is equal to. Okay, so we're going to try to find out what R2 is equal to. So we bring over 10, sorry, 11, and discount it. And then we divide both sides by 11. Then if we take the natural logarithm of E, E falls out. But if we take the natural logarithm this side, we must take the natural logarithm on the other side. And then we're just left on this side a negative and a 2, which is easily to sort out. We just divide both sides by 2, and then we take the negative. So on, on the left-hand side, we isolate our 2, and we can solve. And we can find that the 2-year the two interest rate, LIBOR rate, is 10.46% uh, continuously compounded. So this is a continuous rate. Then to get the 3-year interest rate, we go back to our swaps, other, other swaps contract, the three-year swaps contract, which trades the fixed rate at, uh, on the fixed side, 12 per annum. On the floating side, we know that the one-year interest rate is 10%. We just deduce that the two-year year interest rate is 10.46. The only thing that remains to be found out is then the three-year rate, which is this R3. Otherwise, we know that the floating side, as before, is equal to 100. There's only one unknown. So the, the three year zero LIBOR rate, zero, the LIBOR zero rate is this R3. To solve for that R3, then we follow the same logic as before. We've one unknown. We isolate R3 by itself. We take the present values of the 12 and the 12 in the year one and year two. The 10.46 has been bootstrapped from here. Okay, so we isolate the R3 by itself, we bring over these two, they become negative, we subtract from 100, we divide both sides by 112, we're just left with E negative R3 by 3. To eliminate the exponential factor as before, we take the natural logarithm both sides, and we divide by negative 3. So on this side we have n negative natural logarithm, what we have in the square brackets, divided by 3, and that's 11.46. So the zero LIBOR rate for one year, it was given as 10 already. The two year rate is 10.46. The three year LIBOR rate continuously compounded is 11.46. We also can see, if we just look at the methodology here, that the swaps market allows us then, gives us an insight into the expectations of what the LIBOR rate is, because the swaps rate is ex ante um, an expectation of what the uh, fixed rate should be. And the tr if the three year swaps rate, if the three year swap rate is 12%, that means an average that interest rates are, ex the LIBOR rate is expected for the three years to be 11.46. But there's a term structure here. We have to adjust for that like we did before in terms of government bonds. And we find here that the 
the LIBOR rate in the third year is 11.46.